God's people said. Hey, Amen. I love it when the Holy Spirit's like, you should stand up. You know you want to. Right? And you're like, oh, I just can't sit down. That's so good. You know that scene in Forrest Gump, the movie, where Forrest has just been running? He stops. He turns around. And he says, I'm kind of tired right now. <laughs> been running for a while. I think I'm going to go home. Um, I'm kind of tired right now. Can I be honest with you? I'm not going to go home, so don't worry about that. But it's like, <laughs> I have, uh, I don't, I said this earlier, I don't know if there's such a thing as a Holy Ghost hangover. <laughs> but I was, at the, uh, I was at the New Room Conference this week, and Mark Swayze, his team led worship, and Susan, uh, Susan was there, and Brent Parker, and actually several lay people from our church went. And uh, what I love so much about the New Room Conference uh, is that it, it's not so much a, a Methodist thing. It's not really just a Lutheran thing or a, a Baptist. It's a, it's a Jesus thing. And it's a, it's, a, it's a group of people that recognize that we just need a great awakening in our, in our nation and in our world. And it's just this cry for this movement of the Holy Spirit to, to stir us up, that we would be a people of repentance and confession, but also living out our faith. And it was just one of, the, one, of the more, one of the more holy places and holy moments and encounters and experiences that I've had in a long while. And I'm so grateful. I'm so full, but yet I'm so tired. But I'm so thankful that, you know, I just thought about as I was driving onto the campus this morning, just, uh, just, just hearing the Lord say, hey, um, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power will be made perfect in your weakness. So um, I just, uh, don't, don't buy into the lie that the church has lost its way, that, 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 that the, the, the church is just, it's, it's hopeless and there's no, don't buy into that. Let me tell you, God is stirring something. God is stirring something, and I believe the Holy Spirit is moving, and I will always believe that the good news of the gospel is still the good news that saves us and it transforms us today, amen? So I'm, I'm filled with that, and I pray that you are. If you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and open them up to the, the book of, of James. We're in this series on James' faith that works. I'll be in verses 19 through 27 today. Um, I have to ask a question, and I, w- I want you like, to respond honestly, if you, you will, not that you never don't, but I'm really curious, I'm really curious about this, because, you know, we flew into Nashville, and this conference was at Brentwood, it was at Brentwood, Tennessee, and um, we, uh, we took an Uber, we took Uber and Lyft the entire time that we were there, we didn't really rent a car. How many of you now are actually, like, Ubering, or you're lifting, and you're not, you're not renting a car? How many of you do that when you travel abroad now? I'm just, I'm curious, yeah, okay, not many, but some of you are... And I was just having this conversation with my wife yesterday. Like, we could have rented a car, but I love, I actually love, like, lifting and and Ubering. And I think why I do is because it reminds me of something that actually I believe is kind of sad. We don't normally, today, throw ourselves, sequester ourselves, like, one-on-one with someone that we just have no idea who they are, and just trust them, A, that their car works, and B, that they're going to get us to where we go, right? Like, I think the word growing up, that was stranger danger. You'd never do it. But what I love is, like, it, it puts you in these conversations with people, and, and, you know, if we're not careful, church people, listen, if we're not careful, we only hang out with church people, and we, we forget that we're, we're, like, we're salt and light, that we're called to just interact and not just hang out with people that look like us. So I, I love, we had 15 different drivers this week, and I could, tell, I could write a book on all of their stories. Why? Because Susan and Brent always pushed me to the front passenger seat. They always took the back seat. But I'm cool with that. Like, I could tell you about Aaron. Aaron was a, a college professor, and he was teaching freshmen, and apparently his girlfriend was really expensive, so he lifted to, like, raise money because they had a date this weekend. That's awesome. I could tell you about another guy named Rick, and Rick was, um, he actually was on staff at Joel Osteen's church. He was part of the media team, but he loved music, so he took a big leap, and he was in Nashville. Like, everybody had their story. It was just interesting to get to know him and to talk to him. But I gotta say, I shouldn't rank people, I shouldn't rank God's children, but Audrey, driver number one, when we landed in Nashville, she wins the prize for the most unique. How about we go with that word? (laughs) Audrey, um, we flag it, and there she is, there's her picture, she's in a Tacoma, that's awesome. Takes a while in Nashville Airport to find her, but we find her, we get in. I'm like, hi, how are you? And she says those words that every pastor loves. What do you do? That's what she said to me. And I said, like I do, I said, well, I'm a pastor. And she got real serious and she said, can I tell you some things? So here we go. (laughs) 
Here we go. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. The clerical collar out. Pop that on. Like, let's go, sister. She said, first thing I need to tell you is this. When I drive, I use hand signs. That's what she said. Well, that was easy. And I said, well, Audrey, you know, I'm, I'm in Houston, and people give me hand signs every day on the interstate. So that's all right. Absolved. You're going to be fine. She said, Doc, can I tell you about my church? She, there's some things going on in her church. Y'all pray for a pastor. She's going to talk to him today. They're recycling songs in the church. Heaven forbid they're recycling songs. And there are all these things. That, I'm telling you, there were a million things that were going on. But here's the thing that really intrigued me about Audrey. I'd never seen this. I lifted, I've Ubered a lot. I've never seen this before. Because you know the purpose of a driver, of a Lyft driver, is that they pick you up and they take you to your destination. That's the purpose. And every driver I've ever had, they always have the phone mounted. It's there in the windshield right so they can see. Well, here's what was unique about Audrey. Listen, she had her phone on the floorboard. It was under, like, under the seat and over here. So you'd hear like this little voice say, at the next intersection, turn right. But she's just like, and she'd go right past it. <laughs> now, I'm hyperactive, so I'm hearing what she's saying. I'm being pastoral, but I'm also listening to Siri, who's like, you are not following my direction. So, you know, so I just pull out my phone, and I turn on my map, and I'm kind of like looking over here, and I'm saying, hey, Audrey, yeah, I think up here, exit 67, you want to veer off to the right. And, and sure enough, I said that, and this voice said, Exit 67, veer off to the right and go north. And then Audrey goes, no, that's not right. And she misses it again. <laughs> what was, am I kidding? What was a 20-minute drive we got to our hotel in just under an hour? It was incredible. I got out of that car and I said, Audrey, God bless you. God's richest blessings upon you. And I kneeled down in the Holiday Inn in the lobby and I just kissed the ground. I was like, thank you, Lord. Because the, let's listen, here's the part that just got me. What a crazy thing to have something in your possession. To have a voice that will guide you and tell you where you are supposed to go but you ignore it because you think you know a better way because you don't have time to listen to that voice. Because, do you understand? Are you getting it? Here we go. This is James. This is James, exactly where we are today. Now, James has talked about trials and the testing of your faith. It's not if, it's when. But you lean in, you trust God's wisdom. Don't doubt, God's gonna guide you through it. And just as surely as you can experience trials and all that, temptations are real too. So he says you need to, you know, you need to stand firm. Paul, we talked about armor up last week. There are all these exterior things that James is telling the early believers you gotta be careful about. But here today in this passage, we're going from the external into the internal. Today we're gonna address the heart. Today we're gonna address what God wants to do within us. We're gonna address being hearers and we're gonna address being doers. Now, full, full thing here, full disclosure, I gotta tell you, this is really challenging. And I've really sweated a little bit about this because I know this has stepped on my toes and I'm like, Lord, you don't want me to say that. <laughs> but here's the thing. At the end of the day, I don't preach to be popular, I preach to be faithful. And I pray I never lose that. At the end of the day, it's really not the one in the spotlight, but it's about the one who is on the throne. So if you will, allow me to preach to myself this morning, but if there is any conviction that happens within the context of this message, you pay attention to what fires you off. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is never a bad thing. You know why? Because it means the Holy Spirit's not done with you. It means that you're called to more. So hear these words today. I'm gonna read this from James chapter one. Oh, some of you are like, oh, this is going to be good. James chapter 1, we're going to be fine. We're going to get through it together. And if not, I'll just jet out the back and we'll be fine. I'll lead you in prayer and I'll get in the car and take off. All right, that's not true. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to, what's the word? Listen. Slow to, Eat. and slow to become, Angry. because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. Some of us need to underline that. Therefore, 
Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word that is planted within you, underline that, which can save you. Now, don't merely listen to the world and so deceive yourselves, but do, don't listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. For anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but, what are those two words? They will be blessed in what they do. Now, those who consider themselves religious, and yet they don't keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. But religion that God our Father accepts as pure and Faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So here's where we're going to go today. I'm going to take this and I'm going to break it up into three pieces because in this text, James is talking about three things. Receiving the word, practicing the word, and sharing the word. Join me in a quick word of prayer and then we'll dive in. Father, I thank you for... um, God, I thank you for this word, this word that um, you have so, Lord, you've laid on my heart this week, and and I'm grateful for this word because it is a reminder, number one, that life is precious. God, this breath that we have in our lungs, this breath that we inhale, that we exhale, um, God, it's your breath, it's your story. I don't know where my friends are in this place today. I don't know where those are who are listening to this as a podcast or watching it online. But Lord, what I I love is that you know every hair in our head. That Father, your word says that we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. So it's the hardest prayer to say, God, comfort the afflicted, but if necessary, afflict the comfortable. But that's the prayer I'm gonna throw down today. Lord, you could have chosen anyone to bring this message, but you've gifted me with this incredible moment with brothers and sisters to be able to just open up your word and allow it to speak the truth that you have over us in our life. So God, I pray that you would move us, till up the soil of our hearts, open the eyes of our hearts. For Father, we want to see you. But then God, equip us. Make us brave, make us bold, to not just be hearers of your word, but a little bit further, to be doers, because the world needs to see action among God's people. So it's in your name that we say, amen, amen. All right, Um, I'm gonna start here. When you talk about being hearers and doers, I I couldn't shake about this, this one moment that Jesus had with an expert in the law. So if you have your Bible, flip back. I'm gonna go to Luke chapter 10. And real briefly, it may be a familiar story to you, but I think it's important for us to to get this picture of exactly what James is talking about. Remember, these disciples, they followed Jesus around these stories. Um, They held on to these. So I think that as James talks about certain things, I think they were sparked by moments that that the disciples shared with Jesus. So in Luke chapter 10, it, it begins where Luke shares this really beautiful moment. I I preached about it during our unexplainable series where Jesus takes what I say the the keys are to the church and he throws them to the 72 and he says, listen, I want, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers among his harvest field. I want you to go out in my name and I want you to go ahead of me into towns and cities And I want you to just in my name proclaim proclaim the gospel, proclaim it. And I want you in my name to just pray over people. And I want you in my name to like put feet to these words. And and he sends them out. And the 72, Luke tells us the 72, they go out. We don't know how long they're gone. But we know they come back. And the scripture says that they are filled with incredible joy. Because they said that, look, Lord Jesus, in your name, everything that you said is true. When we go in your name, when we pray in your name, when we move in your name that there's incredible power there. Jesus is filled with all of this joy because the 72 get this picture that we're not just called to sit at the feet of Jesus, but we're also called to be the feet of Jesus in our world, in our culture. So not coincidence then that I believe right on the heels of what hearing 
and doing looks like, Luke would include this story right after this moment with the 72. And it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's the moment where it says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, an expert in the law. Here's a man that we don't know a lot about him, but we know that as an expert in the law, he had a lot of knowledge about Scripture. He had a lot of head knowledge about Scripture. And he's testing Jesus. I don't think he's trying to trap him. I think what's happening here is this is what a rabbi would do. You would ask rabbis questions. So he's wanting to test Jesus, and he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The way he says teacher is showing that he's recognizing the authority that Jesus has. So simple question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And look at what Jesus does. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Don't you love how Jesus would always take a question and ask a question? Like Jesus is thinking, you want me to give you the answer. Well, why don't we just start with where you are? Let's start there, and I'll unpack it. So he said, how do you read the law? Well, here was his response. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's basically going back to the Old Testament. Is this the right answer? Of course it is. Love God, love people, right? And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do you know if you study that, if you break it down in the original Greek, you know what it says? Here's your sticker. I made that up. That's not true. It's <laughs> not true. But Jesus is basically saying, hey, look at you. Yes. Love God and love people. You got a good understanding. And then he said, look at what he says. Do this and you will, what's the word? Live. Do this and you'll live. Pause. John 10, 10. The enemy comes to lie, kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come so that you might have life and you might have it to the full. Jesus doesn't say, the guy says, love God, love people. Jesus doesn't say, okay, well, continue to ponder those deep thoughts and you'll find life. He didn't say that. He didn't say, hey, it's really good, so just keep thinking on that the rest of your life. He says, do, that's an action. Do this and you'll live. And the guy was doing so good. He was doing so good until, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? All right. So he's wanting to show up. He's wanting to flaunt just a little bit. Listen, when you want to justify yourself in the presence of Jesus, just don't go there. I don't think it's going to go very well for you. So Jesus sees there's something going on inside this guy, and that's when he moves into this. In reply to this, Jesus says, let me tell you a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers and they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and they went away, leaving him half dead on the side of the road. Now, a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, which is another religious person, when he came to the place and he saw this man, broken, bruised, bleeding, laying on the side of the road, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. Now, I'll often, when I've taught this before, I always need to bring this up because we've so Sunday schooled this message that I think we've lost a little bit of the impact of what's going on. Because Jesus, listen, this guy, this expert in the law was a Jew, talking to a Jew in a Jewish community. So he's saying, what's the most important thing? Love God, love people, that's it. Jesus says, do it. He's wanting to justify himself to show everyone that's around him Look at how good I am because I know all of the right answers. But yet Jesus identified there was something going on in his heart. So Jesus launches into this parable, this story, right? Fictional story, but there's a deeper meaning here. And here's this man beaten, bruised, laying on the side of the road. And you have a priest who walks by, doesn't stop. You have a Levite who walks by and doesn't stop. So if you're a Jew in this Jewish community and you're hearing this story, you might be tempted to go, oh, 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 I know the answer. It's going to be an everyday, average Jew that's going to be the hero of the story. That's it. But I like to say there was a reason why people wanted to kill Jesus. Because Jesus said, but a Samaritan, when he walked by, he saw the man. Now why? What's the big deal about that? To Jews, Samaritans were a dirty breed. They were a half breed. They were filth. They were waste. You would never waste time. Even looking at a Samaritan, but here <laughs> Jesus chooses the Samaritan to be the hero of the story. And look at, I love 
how Jesus just squeezes this story and makes it so uncomfortable for all the people, especially this man. Look, as he saw, as he traveled, he came to where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man in his own donkey. He brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. (laughs) Jesus is awesome. And then Jesus stops. Jesus comes back into the present. And he looks at this man wanting to justify him who knew all the right answers. And he said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had what? Mercy on him. Quick question. What's the word that he didn't use? Samaritan. He couldn't say it. He couldn't let that come off of his tongue. All he could say is the one who showed mercy. And then, I believe Jesus looks at him. I believe Jesus smiles. And I believe Jesus said these words, go and do likewise. Don't go and think about it. Don't go and pray about it. You got it up here. But what I need you to do, I need you to do it. I need you to love God, and I need you to love people, not just the people that look like you. I need you to be a reflection of God. You know the law. Let the law set you free and be who he's created you to be. Don't just be a hearer, but also be a doer. Do you see it? Now, let's go back to John, or back to James. Receive the word. James says, we've got all this stuff going on on the outside, but don't neglect what's going on on the inside. You gotta let God work in here. That's why he said this. Dear brothers and sisters, take note. Everybody should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Get this. If you don't get anything else, please hear this. God gave you two ears and one mouth, and that was not by accident. Two ears and one mouth. Sometimes it's so easy to just fire off. Sometimes it's so easy to get so swept up that it's easier just to engage in hatred. But James is saying, don't do that. Listen, you need to be quick to just listen. Just remember, Nick, my son's here this morning. When you were little, oh, sorry, I used to say, hey, 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 just zip it. And I think, didn't we make you like literally zip your lips sometimes? Just say, okay, we're going to listen for just a moment. James is saying, don't be fueled by all the hatred and the things you see. Listen, you need to just take a breath. You need to just take it in. Work on the inside, because that's where God does a good work. In fact, he goes on and he says this in verse 21, get rid of moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word that is planted in you, which can save you, that is planted within you. Here's a moment that I think that James is speaking and and uses this agricultural term of just the, the word taking root inside you and not a coincidence, I think he's thinking about the parable of the soils. Remember when Jesus was talking to people and he said, listen, God's word is like seed that's thrown out. A farmer takes God's word, the seed, he throws it out into a field. And and some seed, some seed lands on, on the hard ground. Think of that pathway in between two fields that you would plant, that piece that you would never waste seed on. But yet the goodness of the Father is that his seed, his word is gonna cover the entire world. And, and that seed that's on the path the hard path, the ground is so hard, it doesn't break in, it doesn't go down, so there are birds and things carry that seed away. Well, that's what hatred, that's what anger, that's what bitterness, that's what all of the bad fruit of the Spirit, that's what it does to your heart. So maybe that's where you are this morning, then you just need to ask God to just come in and to start to till up that soil. Because you're, there's always hope. There's always hope. But now there's another type of soil, right? And that's the soil with rocks in it. This is the soil that as you plant the seed, if you don't remove the rocks, maybe there's a, a flash. Maybe there's a little spurt of life that starts to come up. But if those rocks aren't removed, the root system is never going to go down and these plants die. 
You gotta ask God on a daily basis to remove those rocks or maybe there's thorns and maybe that field, the seed that's thrown out and, and the gardener just never goes back to it. You never invite the Lord to come back to you and all of a sudden anxiety, all the things that James has talked about just snuffs out the life. But listen to the good soil. The good soil, Matthew 13, Jesus says, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and allows it to take root understands it. you got to receive it, James is saying. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So you got to let that work change you on the inside. There's this moment where Jesus is talking to Pharisees. Man, the Pharisees would just fire Jesus up sometimes. There's like a righteous anger and righteous anger and justice. And these things aren't bad at all. It is okay to be angry, right? There's such a thing as as, as righteous anger. But the Pharisees were just beating people down and they were so caught up in their positions and their titles. He looked at these Pharisees once and he said, look, you're like whitewashed tombs. And you know what that means? It means that like in first century that, that people would whitewash their tombs. Why? Because if you were walking through a field, if you had a shortcut, you were going somewhere and you bumped up against a tomb and you didn't see it, you would be considered defiled. So you would have to go through this washing, this cleansing ceremony. So people would whitewash their tombs with these really bright, bright whitewashing colors so that you would see them. And Jesus looked at these Pharisees and he said, you're like whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you're all bright and colorful, but on the inside, you're filled with rot and maggots and you stinketh. Taken from a page of how to win friends and influence your neighbor, Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. That's hard. I mean, Jesus would look at the Pharisees and he'd say, hey, you guys, listen. You spend so much time in the rituals, washing the outside of your bowls, just making sure everyone sees, look how great, look how holy I am. But you pay no attention to the flies and the waste that is inside the bowls. Jesus is saying, listen, don't just focus on the outside, but you've got to let it take root in here. Bob Goff and everybody always made this statement. I just heard this this morning when I was coming in. I'm listening to it. and He said, listen, as Christians sometimes... We can be so convicted and so convinced that, you know what, we don't really need to let God do the work, so we just throw sod, those pre-section squared pieces of grass on our hearts so we look like everything else, so we look like we have it all together, but we're not really spending the time with the Father to let him do the work inside that needs to be done. So that's why James in the beginning is like, just silence your mouth, spend time, meditate. If you gotta take a piece of chalk and you need to go into your closet and you just outline your body in the closet and say, God, just work on the person inside the circle and then listen. Give them those things that are tearing you apart. That's where it's got to start. It's got to start on the inside first. You got to receive the word. That's what he's saying. Word that's planted within you. See, here's where he goes. He takes it a little bit further after that. James then moves into, so here's the thing. You got to practice the word. Don't merely listen, verse 22, to the word. And so deceives yourself, but you have to do what it says. It's crazy. I love that when I read this, I, you know, praise the Lord. Y'all know I'm weird, right? Yeah, I, one lady, amen. Did I hear you amen over here? Somebody amen. My wife was in the early service, but I don't know who that was. But yes, so I'm a little weird. So it's funny, like, when I'm reading this, that just how the Holy Spirit, just you get images sometimes, or you get these ideas, and of all the things... You wouldn't expect me really to go back to this Disney movie called Wall-E, but that's the one I thought about. Anybody remember Wall-E, this little Disney movie? I believe it was, uh, Disney was making a statement here. Um, uh, it's the future, and it's planet Earth, and um, Earthlings, surprise, have utilized all the resources. There's nothing left, so it's like just a, a, a giant like trash planet. And Wall-E is this little sweet robot, and his job is, he's got like, a friend, which if I remember correctly, was a cockroach who lived inside a Twinkie, because that's not weird at all. But, like, that's it. But he finds life, I think, right? He finds this, like, little growth, this little plant. He's, like, nurturing it. And then this other little robot comes, and I don't quite understand. I think they fell in love or he found a friend. I don't know. But I know this. He ends up on this place where all of the earthlings have gone. They're, they're on this ship. Now, here's, here's the image. Just go with me for a minute. 
The picture of humanity that you get in this movie is that we have all become very complacent. We have all just, we have landed in our chairs and there are screens in front of us that give us everything that we need to know. All of our food, everything is just in cups and we just consume and we drink and, and they're like, they're riding along on their little scooters and there are people next to them that they could actually turn their head and talk, but they don't. Everything that they do is in screens. Never get up, never move. And I gotta, I gotta ask the question, if we're not careful, is this not where the church could be? That we, we have become so content to just consume, to consume and to consume. What can the church give me? What can the church do for me? That we have so watered down the blood of Jesus and we've condensed the power, Jesus' bride, to the strip mall and we judge it based off of the atmosphere or the haze. It's like, what can the church do for me? And we've become a people that we just come in and we drink and our spiritual muscle, we've lost it. And we're not actually a people. We're so busy to come in and to get pepped up and to get excited, but then to conform back into the world that we're not actually doers of the word. It's a conviction that I have. As a pastor, it's a place that I want to continue to encourage you. Look, it is always such a blessing. It is. Please don't get this wrong. Don't email me. You tell me, pastor, that was just the greatest sermon. Home run. Best one I've ever heard you do. Thank you. That always, truly, it does mean a lot. But if you really want to bless me this week, and if you really want to like amp me up and get me excited, share a story with me this week of how you took these words and how you put feet and muscle to them and how you went out and shared with someone what you got in this space. Because we're not called just to be hearers. We're also called to be doers. We're not called to just take it in and to get all the right things and to have all the right answers. Bible studies are not bad. Bible studies are not bad. You can do a lot of things in the church. It's not bad. But listen, if we're not putting flesh to our faith, if we're not going out, then what are we doing? I love the story of like the wedding at Cana. It's in John chapter 2. And this moment where Jesus goes to, goes to this party with Mary, clearly it's people that, that they know and, and they've been at this party for a while and they run out of wine. People that love wine, love this story. They talk to me about this all the time. That's awesome. And Mary comes to Jesus. Do you remember? She looks at Jesus and she goes, you gotta do something. They're out of wine. It's like the worst thing in the world. You gotta do something. And, and Jesus looks at his mom and he goes, hey, my time, it hasn't come yet. Like, I can't. But this is what I love. Mary looks at the servants at the wedding and she says, you do what he tells you to do. Now, here's the fork in the road. Jesus has a good, good heavenly father, but you know he's got an earthly mother too. <laughs> come on. So I just think Jesus smiles and says, okay, okay, okay. And he looks at these servants who are there. Now, this is a big deal. They're out of wine. He looks at these servants. He says, okay, there's these six jars. I want you to go, and I want you to fill them up with water. Just fill them up with water. And you know these servants are like, Wait, what? Like, we don't need more water. You don't want that well water. That's really gross water. Like, what? But Jesus is just like, just, just, just do it. Just do it. Do whatever he tells you to do. Remember, that's what Mary said. So they go, and they do it. And they fill up these jars and they come back. And then, and then Jesus says, all right, now I want you to take a, a cup. And I want you to go scoop up some of that dirty water and take it to the master of the banquet. Just go give him a sip. That's so weird. We just take this and we're like, that's sweet. No, that's just weird. And you know these servants are like, I'm going to lose my job. This is the worst thing ever. So they scoop up the water. They do it. And they walk over to the master of the banquet and they're like, why don't you try this? And then I think they're just kind of like, okay, I'm going to get out of here. And the master of the banquet, can you imagine? Savers, sips. And he's amazed. Why? Because he goes to the bridegroom. He says, listen, people, wow, they start out with the best wine and they give the cheap at the end. But here, you flipped it. Like, you saved the best 
for last. And everyone at the party, they're all enjoying this. And they're all just like, this is amazing. But the servants are like, what? Everyone's drinking dirty water. What's going on? And I love, I was listening to Mike Pilavachi, who's an evangelist. He was speaking at the conference. He was talking about this. And I love, I think he's so right. He said, don't you know in this moment the servants are there and they're so confused, but everybody's drinking this incredible wine. He said, don't you know Jesus looked at those servants and then went. (laughs) Incredible. And where did it start? You know what? This is cool. I've never thought about this before. The ones at that wedding weren't the ones who were drinking the best wine. They weren't the most blessed there. The ones in the wedding who were blessed were the ones who listened to what Mary said. Do whatever he tells you to do. And those servants, it rocked their world and it changed them forever. I guarantee it. You want to know how you spell faith? You spell faith R-I-S-K. R-I-S-K. Faith is spelled risk. you got to take these moments where you hear the Spirit speaking to you. Don't push it under the seat. Don't talk over it. But as God works within you, James is saying, then do it. Because the blessing is in the doing. What does he say? He says this. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. I don't want to just settle for half a blessing. Can you imagine? You could go your entire life and you could just receive the blessing of hearing God's word. That's it. But that's half the blessing. Maybe the greater blessing is in the doing. Maybe the greater blessing is in putting feet to our faith. So share it. Next week, we're going to talk about orphans. We're going to talk about widows. But here's where I'll I'll end, and I'll lead us into a time of prayer, and we'll sing. 1 John 3.16. I love John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. King James, that's where it is. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But as much as I love John 3.16, let us not be a people that lose 1 John 3.16 through 18 where he says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And knowing this, shouldn't we also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters? If anyone has material possessions and they see someone in need, but he has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Don't live a double-minded faith. Don't show God on the outside, but not act like, not live out of who God has called you to be on the inside. Dear children, let's not live with words or speech, but with actions and truth. So let me do this. I'm gonna close in prayer. Just, there's moments we just need to be on our knees and be okay with that. I'm gonna find myself here, but if you will, just open up your hands in front of you and just close your eyes. So gracious and loving God, um, I thank you for who you are. Father, I thank you for your love. God, I pray, there's just, there, there are people in this space today that are hurting. God, I know it. The Holy Spirit's just put names. The Holy Spirit's just put these burdens on my heart. There are deep wounds that people are carrying. And God, I believe there's someone in this space today, they want to receive healing. They want to receive just freedom from a cut, from something that was done to them. But God, they don't know how. Yet this morning, you're just saying, just give me your heart. Start there. Just loosen the grip of those things that are going to destroy you. There's an addiction in this room right now, and it's destroying someone. And you feel like you're drowning. God's saying, open up your hands. Just as Jesus was there for Peter to lift him up out of the water and to hold his hand and to walk him back into the boat, Christ wants to meet you in your addiction. He wants to meet you in your brokenness for those of us, Father, that have become complacent. We've just become consumers, but God, we're not living out of our faith and becoming doers as well. Holy Spirit, convict us this week. I pray that there are brothers and sisters in this room that take bold steps. Lord, until we hear the trumpet sound, we have work to do. So let's see the orphans. Let's see the widows. Let's stare at people in the margins because, Jesus, this is exactly where you found us and you said, beloved and beautiful, be glorified, Father, for what you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you're going to do, we say amen.